Welcome to some new r slash malicious compliance stories, where people comply to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. I hope you had a great day. The first story is called No Blue Jeans. Many years ago, I worked for a large, well-known insurance company. We were working hard to meet a ridiculous deadline for a big new flashy sales system. We were, as a rule, working anywhere from 12 to 16 hour days. We are not happy about it, but we are going to get it done. Toward the end of the arduous march, the bosses appear with an announcement. The rest of the time leading up to the deadline would be casual days. You have to understand that this was at a time when you would have the clothes you would wear to work and a couple of things you would wear on weekends. Maybe you would have one or more outfits you'd wear on business casual days. Khakis, polo shirts, something like that. Most of us definitely didn't have enough work presentable casual clothes to be able to deal with all casual days. Then the bosses amended their announcement. No blue jeans. That sent most of us into a tizzy. Not only do I barely have enough time to do my laundry because of this insane deadline, now I have to go shopping too and spend a lot of money I don't have on clothes I don't need. Great. But this was not for me. I sue and have been suing for a long time. I went home and made jeans. Yellow jeans, grey jeans, pink jeans, any color but blue. This drove the bosses crazy. Mine called me in and let me have it. I'd been told not to wear jeans to work. Um, no. I was told not to wear blue jeans and these jeans are most definitely not blue. It made him nuts that he couldn't do anything to me. Needless to say, from then on I was considered a troublemaker and not a team player, which I knew would happen, but I just love pushing those buttons. The next story is called As Per The Contract. About 25 years ago, my grandfather made a deal with his longtime tenants. They are allowed to build a carport next to their garage, but after 10 years my grandfather will become the owner. About 2 months after the carport changed the owner and now belong to my grandfather, we get a letter that there are a lot of minor damages through wear and tear, time and weather. And since the ownership contract will really changed, he would like to have it repaired on grandfather's time. He already found someone, a friend of his who made a reasonable price for the repairs. This included a lot, not just damage fixes, but also a new paint job and some new foil against rain etc. My grandfather went to inspect the damages for himself and answered his tenant that while he valued the effort and the cost estimate, it wasn't economically viable. So he would send my father and me to tear it down, as it would just be more cost effective. In the end, both agreed that the damages weren't that severe and it could probably safely survive another decade or two. The third story is called 17 cents. I work as a delivery driver, pizza, burgers, subs, wraps, etc. I've been doing it for over a decade and I've never rocked a gig where you've been given pocket change, just singles. A couple of years ago, before the whole 2020 thing, I was on delivery and her change was a couple of dollars and 17 cents. I gave her her singles and bid her a good evening. She then said I didn't give her all her change. I told her we aren't provided pocket change, so I don't have pocket change to give. She makes a big deal and threatened to call my boss and get me fired. I told her he would tell her the same thing I did and repeated, we don't provide pocket change. She then takes a picture of me and my car and says she's going to call the police and have me arrested for theft. Over 17 cents. I laughed and said I might have some change in my car. Hearing this news, she sat down smugly and started eating her pizza. I throw my change in my cup holder sometimes. I was drinking a frozen water that day and there was a lot of water in my cup holder from condensation. So I counted out 17 soggy pennies, walked back up to her porch where she's eating and give her 17 wet soggy pennies. As I walk back to my car, I hear her tell her friend, that idiot gave me pennies. I just chuckled to myself and said, yes, I did. She still called and complained to my manager who got a good laugh out of it. He told me I didn't have to give her pocket change and could have just let her call. I told him I knew, she was just being so rude about it, I decided to comply to the best of my ability. The next story is called No Small Contracts. This was several years ago, when I was working as an installs coordinator for a department store. If you wanted work done, anything from installing a toilet to building a garage, you'd come to me. I'd give you a quick estimate and if you were on board after that, send a contractor out to your site to do exact measurements, if needed. 
then I would work out your exact material and labor costs from there, quote you out and keep in the loop with the contractor, mostly so I could help work out anything that might delay the work. Contractors are paid a set rate, usually per unit, foot or square foot. They also get a flat $50 for the initial site visit, whether or not the customer goes through with the project. I occasionally got calls from frustrated tradesmen who felt these $50 visits were a waste of their time. But since those visits typically took under an hour, including travel, and I was making $3 over minimum wage, I couldn't drum up a whole lot of sympathy for these complaints. Most of our contractors came in two categories. Bigger companies that generally had a liaison who wanted to keep their business partners happy and individual tradesmen or father-son businesses where the person I spoke to on the phone would be the one doing the work. I was fortunate enough to be trained by my predecessor who remained at the store but had stepped down to take a less stressful position, so I could go to him for advice. And more importantly, he helped me quickly build a rapport with the people I worked with. This would become important because I had wide discretion in how I divided up the jobs. Many of our partners were fairly specialized or simply preferred certain kinds of work a fact that our systems weren't set up to accommodate. Officially, I was meant to rotate through lists. I used this plumber last time, so used that one this time, etc. There was no metric in place to track that I was doing that, however, nor any interest in enforcing it. As a result, I could send more work to people I knew were in a bad financial spot, skip somebody who I knew was planning a vacation or had a sick worker, etc. Maybe a couple of months into the job, I got a phone call from a bigger construction company on my list, turning down a site measure I had sent him to fence a yard. I put this file up on the screen for the call and realized that he had kicked back the last three jobs I'd sent to him. He demanded I stop sending me these little jobs. I'm not interested in anything under 100 grand. His file listed him for fences, decks, garages, etc. But there was nothing in his contract about a minimum job size and I'd have been surprised if there was. So I just told him, sure, and ended the phone call, then put a note on his file not to use the company. The price of lumber doubled that summer. And the combination of four refused site measures in a row, along with not doing any work for us in over a certain number of months, automatically ended his preferred contractor status with us. So he was paying more for materials. He paid close enough attention to his business to stop work he didn't like from coming in, but never noticed that his materials cost went through the roof overnight. I know the company had a rough couple of years after that. As far as I know, they are still in business. But I hope that dude has mellowed out a little and how he talks to the people who had put work across his desk. We were never a big slice of his income. But I like to hope my small malicious compliance had put just a little more of a squeeze on him. The last story is called Hot Means Hot. When I was 18, I was working at a place called Captain D's, which is pretty much fast food seafood. As a cook, my job was to extract the hot oil from the huge deep fryer into a portable vat that runs the oil through a filter. The oil stays around 350 to 375 degrees Fahrenheit while we run it through the filter. One morning, the portable vat is broken and won't suck the oil up. Well, my manager had a bright idea and asked me to dab a plastic 30 gallon bucket. I wasn't dumb enough to try it. I started arguing with my manager that it's a very bad idea. She keeps on about how they can't open without the oil being clean. After 5 minutes of explaining how hot oil will melt plastic, I said screw it and told her to watch this. I grabbed a metal ladle and put just a cup full of the scalding hot oil in it. Then I grabbed the 30 gallon bucket and poured the oil into it. It literally starts melting into itself, sucking it upwards while hot oil starts dripping out of the bottom. The look on her face was priceless. She went from a smirk I told ya so look to oh god you were right. All I could say is I told ya so, loud enough for everyone to hear it. It was honestly the worst job I've had cooking. No one likes to smell like old fishy oil and be bossed around by a manager that doesn't understand what hot is. And with that we end today's video. Let me know what you think about the stories. On a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate the stories and today's video? I hope you enjoyed the video. If you like what I do and would like to support me, please subscribe and hit the like button. I hope you have a great day. Stay safe. Bye bye.